But uh, getting back to, uh, to some of the other things that were going on in Foggia was that uh, uh, I was assigned uh, to, we, we set up an office really in a separate building from the headquarters and the, the engineers also were there and the material, the material, uh, capture materials, you know, was next to us. But uh, while we were there, a, lo a lot of things happened. One day, the uh, uh, the mayor came in and he said uh, there was a bomb in a building, and this was just down the block from us. And he said the darn thing hadn't gone off, but it was right across from the town hall. And so he wanted somebody to come down and take a look at it. This is soon after we got there. So Erskine and I went over and we went in, and here's another, believe it or not. Here was an American bomb came through a roof and through a second floor and landed on, on the, uh, well, landed on the flooring of the second floor, unexploded, and sliced in half from front to back, just as if you took a knife like this. Half of it laying there unexploded, the other half had exploded. <laughs> now, how can this possibly happen? <laughs> you know, uh, and it's a, uh, Kind of embarrassing because this is an American bomb. We're talking to an Italian, <laughs> and here's a half of a bomb laying there, and they want us to get rid of it. Well, there's no problem getting rid of it, but we had to figure out why did this happen. Now you have to understand that in the making of a bomb, the way they make it is they pour in, and they're supposed to puddle. Uh, you know, they set the bomb on end like this, nose down, take the base plate off and you just pour, uh, the TNT is the liquid uh, in the right temperature, <laughs> uh, and you pour it in and then you take a wooden paddle and, and stir it up so that you get all the air out, so that it's a really dense material. Something happens. Maybe the guy left the paddle in the, in the lantern <laughs> or something, but at any rate, there must have been an air pocket through there that prevented the, the contact that was necessary to make the, the other half go off. Well, we got rid of that one, but that's another, believe it or not, you know, there's some of these things you just can't explain. Well, we got back from that job. Incidentally, the mayor went to the headquarters and he wanted me made a, a lieutenant. He wanted to get me a commission. <laughs> I laughed at him, I said, no way. At this stage, I didn't, didn't want to be an officer anymore. It was a little too dangerous to be a, an officer, I figured. That was out in the field. Too. So, and so uh, we get back to these, uh, our headquarters, and it was on the down the street, uh, a block or two. And then uh, this, this happened uh, around the same period of time. Uh, we got a phone call from headquarters, which was uh, in the main building away. Anyway, and get over to the mess hall right away. We had an explosion in the mess hall. So Erskine and I go over and we looked around. We, the first thing we think, who got hurt? You know, who got killed or anything like that? The mess hall was a mess. <laughs> and uh, so we asked the, the, uh, the cook that was there and we said, well, just exactly what happened? And he said, he didn't know, but he was cooking, he had, placed on a stove a pot of water and he was putting cans of chicken. Now the officers were getting chicken. <laughs> they, cans of chicken into this water. And so uh, he put them, a can in there and he'd gone off to get a, a box of these chicken, cans of chicken. And while he's gone, this thing blows up. So he didn't get hurt. But he had the new box coming in. So we examined the whole thing. And what we detected was that somebody had gotten into the ration dump, probably Italians. And they took the can of chicken and ringed around like that, took the chicken out, and replaced another can inside of it, but that put carbide in, in the can. When the, when the water was boiling, it came up into that carbide, well, blew up. <laughs> you never know. So those are some of the things that then uh, about that time too, 
there was a clean closet, two clean guys from, they looked like they were, they were Americans, but they looked, they were just in, dressed in plain clothes. I forget now what outfit they belonged to, but it was some kind of an intelligence group that was operating for the Americans in through Italy. And they came in and uh, asked us to accompany them down to the southern part, uh, well, just a little bit south of, uh, of uh, Foggia, uh, to go to a farmhouse. And at that farmhouse, they put us up very nicely. The farmer had a like a, a big garden complex, buildings all around. He was one of the richest farmers uh, in uh, that part of Italy. And uh, he had reported that he was hearing some loud noises from up on the castle that was on top of the hill. Now this castle, uh, as I remember it, was on a, a hill and you could, from the top of the castle, you could see the water around. So. Uh, Parts of the Mediterranean, parts of the, uh, uh, I guess, I, I don't know what part that would be, but it was water around, uh, the sea water around. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the morning, uh, they told us what they wanted us to do. They wanted us to go up and take a look in this castle and uh, uh, check it out for booby traps or mines or whatever might be in it. So Erskine and I went up, <laughs> and here is the drawbridge, this, this is an old time castle, probably around maybe the 1300s or 1400s. And it was big, huge. And uh, the moat was uh, just about dry at that time of year. But the drawbridge was partly down, about that far. So we could, we backed the truck up, and we could stand in the back of the truck and lift ourselves up onto the drawbridge so we could get into the Sarn Castle. Well, when we got in, and we, we heard it before, but as we go in, there was a lot of barking going on. And so we were very cautious. So we both had our revolver. Well, I was carrying a 40, we were both carrying 45s at the time. So uh, we both drew our guns and we're, we were afraid we we're gonna be jumped by these dogs. <laughs> well, they were behind a graded door, right inside the castle. And the reason they were howling is they were starving to death. They were nothing but skin and bones, and they were dying of pain, actually. The Germans had pulled out, and they didn't, didn't take the dogs with them. Uh, perhaps they were on the run so much that they couldn't take the dogs with them. But it, uh, we felt sorry for the dogs, so we shot them right there. And uh, we, we actually left them behind the grave. But uh, we examined that whole castle, and we did find that they had used it as an observation point. And that was a beautiful observation post. But uh, when we left there, uh, we went back down to the farm and told them, okay, everything's safe now, you can go ahead. And the two guys from, I think they were, I don't think they were FBI, but they were an intelligence group. They said, okay, now you have one more job to do, but uh, you don't need us because this farmer will give you the, the uh, route to take up to another farm. It's on the way back to Foji. Okay, so we take off and we found the farmer, all right? And the farmer, uh, Erskine always uh, was really, he was a gentleman when it came to uh, beating people like that. And he went up to the farmer and he said, okay, what's your problem? And uh, the farmer said, well, in my fields over here, there's a mound and we have a, a dud bomb in there and uh, I have cattle over there and I would like to get rid of this dud bomb. So we said, well, where is it? Well, it's over there behind this wood through that ravine. He said, well, gee, how are we going to get this truck over there? It was a weapons carrier that we had, a, a, well, a three-quarter three ton truck. Uh, but uh, the farmer said, well, we can take horses. So uh, Erskine smiled right away, because Erskine came from Virginia, and he owned horses uh, and a ranch down in Oak, uh, uh, Vinton, Virginia, as a civilian. He was a VMI graduate, incident. Uh, but when he heard horses, that was right up his alley, because he loved to ride horses. Then the last time I was on a horse, uh, 
I was led around a pony trail like this, and I think I probably slid off. <laughs> but anyhow, he came out with three horses, and Erskine's happy, he gets on the horse, and they had a kind of force me on the horse, and it was an old plug anyhow, and we head off, and I took the, out of the truck, I took enough uh, munitions to blow up this one bomb. It said there was only one bomb. So, uh, we get out there, and we looked it over, and this mound, and here's this bomb standing about like this, just the tail section sticking out, and uh, there's not much around out in the field. So I just said, well, this is an easy job. I said, why don't you just get the equipment out of the truck and, and we'll back off of, of it. So I went over and I got my box of TNT and, and a long, well, we had a, a reel of a fuse cord and so, and caps and stuff like that. And I picked up a shovel and I went over, while I'm over there, they took the horses, went behind the trees and into this ravine. And I cleared away on the surface of the bottom and put my three blocks in and put the cap in. And I cut a piece of fuse from here to there because I had to run. The, the horses were over there. I had to get out of there. So I lit it and ran over. And that was the beginning. And that was the first automatic dispenser for fertilizer that you ever saw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that mound was a manure pile. <laughs> well, when we got back to uh, Foggia, uh, the um, well, an incident came up where one of our squads came in and uh, uh, we, they didn't have any place to come. They put them over in the building where I was. So that night we, we played cards together. And the next day that, that squad was called over to Corsica. And uh, they went over with their officer. And I, I stayed behind in uh, Foggia at the time. And uh, they got over there and they were there about two days and every one of them was killed. Uh, that was, they were in a cemetery. They were called to go into a cemetery. They had six men, and uh, they had three Yugoslavian, captured Yugoslavians that were helping us out to clear up. It was a cemetery area, and they were all on a truck going into the cemetery, and the, the Germans had mined the entrance in, and they had a ammunition dumped in the cemetery itself. And when it went up, everybody was killed, I was concerned. So uh, Erskine, that was one of our squads, so Erskine and I were sent over to find the remains of them. And uh, that's one reason. Uh, I didn't want to be in that kind of a situation. But, uh, then I went, we, Erskine and I went on to Corsica, up to Bastia, and we got orders to go to the other shore. <laughs> and uh, the only thing that was told that they were doing in uh, that island was uh, the, the local people were still fighting, but there the weren't any more Germans left. In the, they had been driven out. But uh, the underground, uh, the uh, Corsican Underground was still operating, pretty much so. And uh, Erskine and I were in a, well, we had a jeep at that time, and we went around the, the island, and in order to get from one side to the other, there was only one road open, it was up through a mountain area, and it was getting kind of dark, but those darn guys shot at us. And they did hit our jeep. They didn't hit either one of us, but they did put a couple holes in our jeep, and uh, that wasn't very nice of those people to be doing that. You know, we were on their side. <laughs> but uh, those are some of the things that went on. Uh, oh, and on the, on the way over at that time, we went over in a B-25. And uh, this is the first time I ever flew in a B-25 and looked upward to see the trees. 
We had, <laughs> no, actually, I'm not kidding. <laughs> we flew out of, uh, of the Fondi airfield and we kind of approached uh, Korska on the, uh, on the southern side of it. And as we did, uh, a German plane, Strafford, came this way and our pilot had uh, saw this. And you know, the Germans came in at quite an angle and their, their speed was a little bit faster than our B-25s. But our pilot took us right down to the water. I could look out the window and see the wash from the props kicking up the waves. And I look up and see the trees going by, <laughs> but the German never got us. He had to pull up before he could, or else he would have gone right into the water. Because they, uh, they, he could come down, and was, but he didn't get a good shot at us, and we eventually got up to Bastille. But those are just some of the things that happened there. When we got back to, from that trip, uh, they decided, well, uh, maybe they should make me an officer. So <laughs> they put me in a building. The headquarters was like uh, here, and there's a school building over here where the staff was uh, mostly GI staff, and the officer's quarters there, and here's an apartment building. And they decided, well, in this bottom of the apartment, I could have the corner room to myself. And then they had the cooks and so forth, but we were all in the bottom room, and there were Italians living overhead in that same building. But I had a nice big square room, oh, this big square room. And it was that decent bathroom in it. So uh, I got hold of the pot, put it in a corner, and put a couple nails in the wall, and uh, hung a raincoat up and a pair of pants, and, and uh, I'm sitting down, I found a nice chair. A good sized chair. And I used to come in with some of these ammunitions, some of these grenades and so forth, and some small shells, and I'd take them apart and I would empty, I'd sit in a chair like this, and I had my coffee can here, and I'd just pour the, the, the black powder into that, and then I'd reassemble the, the souvenirs over here. So this one day I'm sitting there, and uh, one of the cooks came in, he saw me come in. So he thought, oh boy, he's got some, uh, something to hand out today. So he came in, and uh, when he came in, I said, look, you're smoking a cigarette, sit over there. So he's sitting over there about across the wall like this, and I'm sitting in a chair, and we're talking, and uh, without thinking, you know what you do with a cigarette when you take it out <laughs> like that? <laughs> he hit that can dead center. Right off my, right off of my elbow, and that can was about half full of black powder. Well, it went up the wall. It, the the raincoat, its normal size, came to be about that big. Patch. <laughs> the pants that I had there, I had a little money in a in a watch pocket. The, the the pants were sheared right off, but the money wasn't touched. <laughs> but I was singed a little bit on the hair, but not, not, not her at all. But how often, I come and hit with a cigarette, I come and hit it like a hundred, one in a hundred times. But that's the kind of thing we had to watch out for. Well, uh, yeah, they called me in to, be, to go before the board, and uh, I said, well, I wasn't too enthused about it, but I, I would go. So, I went before the board, and they only asked me one question, and so I figured, well, you know, <laughs> they, uh, they must want me, or else they'd ask me more questions than that. And I went back and they said, they'd let me know. Well, I had to go through a physical. And uh, so, as I say, I had been in Sicily quite a while, and across the island, we hadn't been eating very good, and I was down to about 112 pounds. I'd gone from 145 down, down maybe to about 115 actually pounds. And I was way underweight and my teeth were in bad shape. They turned me down physically. I said, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to be an house really happy. So uh, I didn't get the commission. Then uh, while I was in that building, uh, one day a, a fighter plane came over. It was the, the uh, an American P-38. Uh, you guys know about the P-38, the twin boom? Yeah. Well, this pilot had been, uh, his plane had been 
hit in, in one of his engines so that he would circle. He could circle around, but he was losing altitude. And they got in contact with him. He was flying over, over the town. And they got in touch with him to bail out and with the intent that he would fly away from a little bit and then bail out of his plane and the plane would land out in the field someplace. Well, unfortunately, uh, are there any P-38 pilots here? Anybody? Well, you know about the P-38. It was, it was in 1938. You, you had to take the canopy off the top and crawl out the top and come down over the back end hanging on to a ladder and release yourself and then pull your chute. Well, either this fellow uh, lost uh, his grip on the, on the top. Uh, and at any rate, when he uh, got out, of the, we could see him getting out of the plane. Uh, and he got to, to the back end there, and he must have lost his grip because when he fell, that back boom caught him right in the middle of the back. And he was dead at that time. But he came down on the ground. And the plane circled around, and it landed. <laughs> right outside my room. <laughs> now, I, not right outside, it was uh, maybe a uh, hundred feet away, but it was that close, and when it did, it had ammunition on board, and so it caught on fire, and all this ammunition started exploding around, so the colonel decided that I should have the job of finding out what ammunition was left, and so forth. So, that's a uh, uh, another thing that happened there. As we, uh, after that, I, I got, uh, I, I lost contact here with some of these things. But uh, the next thing that happened there was that, that this is a you again, uh, and we still had Colonel Lynn as our commanding officer. And a new man came in by the name of Davis, who was in the same group of graduates from West Point as uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower was on the bottom of the list. And, uh, Lynn was up high in the list, and Davis was in between. <laughs> Davis and Lynn were full colonels, and of course, by this time, Eisenhower had his about four stars. I don't think he had five of them yet. But at any rate, uh, Davis was going to take over. But in the meantime, the, the uh, Mount Vesuvius erupted. And that erupted about, this is now 1944, uh, about, uh, uh, well, around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And so uh, we were over in Foggia, and so we got the call. And, uh, Disarm Vesuvius? <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> uh, we got the call, and, and uh, Colonel Lynn came over and got, got me out of bed and said, Take me over to Vesuvius. So we did. Erskine and Lynn and myself went over, and uh, I was the driver. <laughs> and uh, we got over there and got into an airplane, and we flew up around. The, while it's exploding, we flew around, and again, these, these high-ranking officers, you've got to be careful. He gave, Lynn gave the order to the pilot, see if you can't get a little closer. Well, yeah, you, you know about the engines. You get dust and dirt and those things, and they begin to cough. Well, we got a little closer, they were coughing. <laughs> the, the pilot said, no more, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get out of here. But anyhow, we circled around, and what we were doing, we were watching where the streams of lava came down, because at the base of the of the Soviets, we had B-25 station, we had bomb stations, uh, our, our bomb uh, supply was there, small arms ammunition, and a roadway down there, and a number of soldiers sleeping in tents at the bottom of this. Well, when that exploded, some of the chunks of hot molten lava came right down through the wings of the B-25s. Now, this was kept secret for the longest time. If you look through here, you'll find one of those B-25s being pulled out by another truck. The lava dust and ash got so deep that you couldn't, uh, we had to get a big uh, 
trucks in there to haul the, the planes out. They couldn't go out by themselves. Uh, the, the ash was that deep. But we did lose a few men there. Uh, but it was due to the volcano. But uh, our job was to divert the streams a lot away from these bomb storage areas, which we did. And that made Colonel Lynn very happy. So he decides he would take Erskine and myself down to Pompeii. Now this is a real treat because when the last time Vesuvius erupted, well, it was in the old days when it buried the city of Pompeii. And uh, so we went through, uh, he paid all his expenses, he, but he, he made me wash up quite a bit. <laughs> we got uh, our uniforms cleaned up and we went down and he hired a guide to take us to the city of Pompeii. When I went in, I had a nice, a fairly decent uniform on. When I came out, it was covered with ash. That's how the, the wind was blowing down there. I don't know if you've been to Pompeii. Has anybody been to Pompeii here? Yeah. Well, you know about the history of Pompeii, so there's no use to go through that sort of thing. But I was amazed. Uh, I learned an awful lot of these various things. They had some of the nicest uh, facilities back in those days that you could imagine. They had cobble streets with gutters, and their gutter system emptied into the ocean, into the sea. So they had a big swimming pool uh, area, and uh, uh, they had locker room service, and, and also uh, an arena around it. They also had, uh, I shouldn't mention this, but they, they had certain shops around. You guys over there, you know about them. But anyhow, uh, it was uh, for its day, it was a modern, uh, really modern city. And, and so, but uh, after uh, several events there in, in Fulgia, uh we went back over to, uh, well, I, I, Erskine and I were sent uh, up to a place uh, at that time, also, the uh, uh, Monte Casino was being heavily bombed. And we had a squad over there at a place called Dayton, I think you pronounce it. And so we went over to visit the squad. And we had some jobs to do over there, but when we got there, the mud, I'm not telling you a lie, it was more than ankle deep. And that's where we were sleeping. They were sleeping in this stuff. And it rained and rained and rained. And so we pulled out of there in a hurry. So uh, uh, we, we couldn't do anything. Uh, and the, as I said, the casino was being bombed regularly. That was another mistake our army made. We should you know, we should have just bypassed it, but we decided to bomb. But uh, uh, Erskine said, well, let, let's go back to Naples and we'll go back to Fulgi. So we had a Dodge three-quarter ton truck at the time. And, uh, <coughs> It had uh, the back, we had boards, well, seats along the back, so we could have a, a squad get in there. And uh, so I never knew what Erskine was going to do. We, we got to Naples and he said, uh, let's go down the docks. So we, we go down the docks and, one of, uh, and we're coming in, into the town. And he said, but before we go down there, he said, uh, we'll go by, when we're going by this field, he said, let's pick up some of this straw this hay here. I'm wondering, what the heck is this guy doing now? So he had me load the bottom of the truck with straw, and we had uh, in the front wells uh, where the seats were, we had uh, such things as uh, TNT and wires and uh, detonators and things like that stored in there. So he said, coordinate those so we had a little more room. So we put straw on there. You pull up to the dock and he goes into the liquor store. And he does a deal and he comes out and he loaded that truck with cognac. <laughs> well, I don't know if you ever drank that stuff, but that burns all the way down. But <laughs> he paid for it and he loaded the truck and we go back to Folgers and we were very popular back in Folgers. <laughs> he was very generous with his liquor, but he had to have his drink. When, when we went, when we were out any place, when he'd wake up in the morning, he would reach for the water. And uh, I didn't drink. Uh, I couldn't stand the stuff that way. <laughs> it isn't that I didn't drink, it's just that I couldn't stand it that way. But that's how we got through the war, because 
Whereas he needed a drink to do certain things and get his nerve up. Uh, I was sober enough that we complimented. Uh, he always took my word. If I said, no, we don't do it this way, we do it the... Uh, he never gave me a direct command to do anything like that. There was one instance when this happened uh, a little bit north of Folger, when a British plane came by and bombed the railway. And uh, this railroad was uh, uh, a north-south, it was a main route, very late. Right? And the, the bomb landed in an angle like that, and here's your railroad tracks, and there's a little tunnel bridge over here, and this was an unexploded British bomb. Well, we both knew something about British bombs, but uh, we went up and looked at it, and we dug away and found out that it had an anti-withdrawal device in the tail end of this bomb. It was unexploded. And this anti-withdrawal device was such that we were given instructions. Don't ever attempt to take this thing out because you just can't do it. And uh, uh, we also, the Americans also had an anti-withdrawal uh, fuse, which I was able to take out. I discovered how to take the darn thing out and uh, without exploding the bomb. But it was very, very tricky. And so that's one of the things that uh, uh, I could do, but he couldn't. But he said, I think we ought to take it apart. Take the fuse out. I said, no way. We'll take a chance. We'll pull the darn thing out by winch, and we'll, we'll uh, just blow it up in the field. And that way, uh, we don't have to worry about anything. So he said, OK, you can go back and get the truck. We had parked the truck away. If the bomb went off, the truck was safe, you know. So <laughs> I go back and I, while I'm back getting the truck, this darn fool goes up on the bomb and decides he's going to take the fuse out. Well, he did. And I don't know about this. So I'm bringing the truck up. He took the fuse out and it went off. He heard it click. And when I got there with the truck, he was fastened to the bomb so tightly, and he was white, he thought he was dead. And, and he was just motionless. And I talked to him, and no response. And that's the first time I ever, I slapped his face. I had to slap his face to bring him to. And, I, and he was still holding on to the fuse. And I said, what happened? He said, it went off. And uh, I said, well, let go, and we'll back off. So I got him back to the truck and we pulled out of ways. And then uh, later on, uh, when, we, when we talked about it, we realized that it had fired. But because when the bomb hit, the striker pin, now this is another, believe it or not. You know, in a cap fuse like that, about this, you know what a 22 bullet looks like, the cap end of the bullet? Uh, the striker, instead of hitting that cap, went between the pocket of the fuse and the fuse itself, the, the cap itself, and wedged there. So now the bomb couldn't go off. <laughs> so we took the, took the uh, base plate off and got the fuse out, pulled the bomb out and got rid of it. And you'd think this guy would get down on his knees and, you know, <laughs> but no. He decides, well, on the way back, we came across the British outfit. And it was a, uh, again, an airstrip. And uh, the air commander in that group, an airstrip says, stop, let's go and visit the, these people. I had not, no idea what he's up to again. So he puts this fuse in his pocket, and he goes up into to the commander, this British commander's place, and he takes the fuse and puts it on his desk, and he starts <laughs> telling those people, about their poor fuses and all this sort of thing. <laughs> and he, he's criticizing them for making their manufacture of these dud bombs and all. And we walked out with a couple of bottles of liquor. <laughs> but the guy, he was just unbelievable. But anyhow, by this time now, he was a major and, uh, uh, and I was still a sergeant. <laughs> and, uh, well, a couple other things happened on, but we went on, uh, well, the, the 15th bomb squad that 
I was with back in Algiers had appeared. They had come up to Italy, and that was the British group, of course. And they were stationed over near Chernobyl. Uh, you guys have flew out of Italy. You know where Chernobyl is? No? Nobody yeah. here flew out of Italy? Yes. Yeah? Oh, OK. Well, uh, over there, there was a firefight one night, and our squad got caught in it. And so uh, uh, Erskine went over, and I followed over after it. So. And uh, while I was over there, I learned out that the 15th bomb disposal squad, the British bomb disposal squad, had pulled in to that area. So I thought, well, this is a good time to go over and visit with some of the boys. So I went over, and now this was a, a squad of about, uh, originally about 75 men. Uh, they included cooks, riggers, truckers, all sorts of things. But I had been the diffuser for the group back in Africa. When I got there, I didn't recognize that young. Every man in that squad had been uh, either sent back to England as a casualty or killed. And I got there about two days too late when the, the, the last ones of them were blown up in that firefight. But uh, that's some of the things that just go on from time to time. But uh, after all that, I was sent up to Anderson and, and the whole group. We were sent up to Anzio. But uh, Erskine and I went up to, we got called to Anzio because the fighting was pretty bad up in there, and we had a squad at Anzio. And uh, we got word back that the officer in charge of the squad uh, could no longer uh, operate. He was, his nerves were shot, and uh, so he, he was a, a mental case. And so they had to evacuate him, put him on a hospital ship and get him out of there. But that left the squad without any real command. So Erskine and I were flown up in a Piper Cub to land at Anzio Beach. <laughs> it's not no, a good way to, to enter into a battle zone. But we flew in over the water, and they landed us on the beach. And we got out, and the plane went back. And we found the squad all right. And in the meantime, uh, the fighting had died down quite a bit. But I did manage to get a picture, and you can look in this group here, uh, of uh, uh, the, big, the biggest gun the Germans had. It was the railroad. It took up two railroad cars. It was the, the old days they called it the long top. But it, uh, that was the biggest gun uh, that they, they had. And uh, I have a picture of that uh, at a distance uh, of that gun. But anyhow, Erskine and I finally wound up going into Rome. And uh, when we got to Rome, they decided we should inspect the telephone exchange for booby traps and so forth. Then, you know, here we are. One day we're looking at bombs, the next day we're looking at booby traps. In a telephone exchange, we don't know what to look for. But we, we were successful. In, and putting our stamp of approval on that we could, they could use a telephone exchange. Meantime, I slept in a, a school building by myself. <laughs> and uh, uh, that night, uh, before I went to the building, the lights came on at St. Peter's for the first time in years. Uh, you'll see a picture of, of uh, in here, someplace, of, the lights going on at St. Peter's. Erskine and I went over to see the light for that. Then we went on up to, uh, to Florence, and when we got to the city of Florence, uh, we again had many experiences. One of them was over at uh, Leghorn, where uh, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, Dole, Senator Dole. Uh, he ran for president. Well, uh, his outfit pulled in over at Leghorn, and uh, I didn't know it. he wasn't uh, a no, well-known man at that time. None of these guys, so these generals, were when we first met them. Uh, and he, he, of course, was uh, in, in uh, a group of uh, just a, another soldier in a group. It just so happened that it was his outfit that we had a service. There was a farmyard, and uh, they had pulled in there, and they had gone into the barn to sleep and one of them slept on a mine. 
So we were called over to survey the group, and we did find that the, the uh, old-fashioned uh, well pump, you know, the, the old handle pump that you had yeah. on the well, uh, that they used for drinking water, they had booby trapped that. And so we found that in time. But uh, uh, on the way back, I stopped off to see the Leaning Tower piece. <laughs> and a few things like that. I always said, well, there's, there's one other time, maybe, maybe I'm not too long here, but if you don't mind, I'll tell you another one. Coming out of Foggia, uh, I'm going back now. Uh, at Foggia, one day, I got a call. Erskine was not around. He was, I, I, he was on another job someplace. I think it was over at the firefight. But anyhow, the, the colonel called me and he said, here's your orders. There's a bomb down in the bomb dump in Oran. A fog is over here, and a thousand miles over there is our, one of our big supply dumps that uh, you know, where the ships were coming in. They were unloading vehicles over there and ammunition and so forth. And there was a big ordnance dump. And one lone German bomber flying out of France, southern France, came over that dump, dropped the bomb, and it didn't go off. So they called me. So uh, uh, you, when you get an order like this, you know, we only gave him the orders and he said, go out and get the 25, we have it warmed up for you, but you might have to ditch it over around Naples because he doesn't have enough gas, but he'll get you that far. <laughs> so, so I go out, get in the plane, he flies me, we go to Capitano, airport and land and I got out of the plane and uh, I got my orders. I ran into the tower and I said uh, there's a, a plane over there it's warmed up and uh, the, the props were going it was it was another B-25 and uh, I said I'm taking that plane and uh, the guy behind the house he puts my orders okay uh, and with, with that this guy standing over here he says, like when I said, I'm taking that plane, this guy says, the hell you are. I turn around, it's a general. <laughs> and he said, that's my plane. I said, general, I'm taking your plane. <laughs> and I said, here's my orders. He looked at him, he says, you go ahead. I can get another plane very easily. <laughs> but anyhow, I went back to uh, Orion, and it was a simple job. I, I took care of it. But I had a, when I got over there at uh, Oran, I knew it was going to take a little while to get this thing handled up pretty good. So I released that plane so I could get back to, to the general. But uh, that's the first time I had ever bumped the general from his own plane. But uh, uh, there I was in Oran, a uh, thousand miles away from my headquarters. Now my orders, I completed my orders, but I didn't have any way to get back. So I had a hitchhike on a military craft, so I went to Algiers, I visited a group there that I had known. Then I went to Tunis, Bob Hope was having a show, so I went to see the Bob Hope show. So I get back to uh, uh, Tunis, and from Tunis I got back to Foggia. Well, it took me maybe about 10 days to make the trip. <laughs> and this is the way you had to live, you know, you had to take advantage of certain things. There was one other thing that happened to me in Foggia. There's always one other thing. But we were out outside of the town of Foggia, out in the field, and a new, one of our new squads came in. And so when the new squad came in, they generally came from the States, and they weren't too well versed in, in types of things going on in the war zone. So we always instructed them on how to take fuses out and, and how to deal with bombs. So this one day we were out and the squad was there and Erskine and I had given them the instructions and we said, okay, now you fellows are gonna blow this thing up by yourself. We're gonna back off, but just stand by uh, and uh, we had it all rigged up, they rigged it up properly, and we backed off to a ravine, and we, the signal was going to be that Erskine was going to give a signal uh, with his hand as to when they should hit the plunger uh, and blow the, the bomb up. Well, something happened. I was standing on top of a little knoll in the ravine behind me, and 
whether Erskine had slipped or whatever, anyhow, my hand went up and the bomb went off. And Erskine didn't get hurt. He was, uh, I, for some reason or other, he was either a little bit lower or something. But it, the bomb lost like it caught me in the stomach. And I was out. Uh, that was a Wednesday. <laughs> and they took me to the hospital. And I didn't have any shrapnel, but I had the bomb blast in my stomach. And it just compressed me there. And uh, I was unconscious. And I was in the hospital. And I woke up the next day with somebody rubbing my back with alcohol. And I didn't know who it was or anything like that. And uh, uh, I came to. And uh, here it, it was uh, a Red Cross person, a woman. And you might have known her, uh, Mrs. Clark Abel. Her name was Carol Lombard. Wow. <laughs> so she rubbed my back, and we talked a little bit. And uh, about uh, all three or four days later, I got a call. Would I please escort Carol Lombard, uh, Mrs. Gable, to the officers' quarters for a dinner dance? I was to be her escort. Which I did. I escorted her to the to the Fauci dinner dance, and I, I have a souvenir of that, and also a picture of her in her uh, Red Cross uniform. Uh, well, we got to the officers' mess. That was the last I saw her until it was time to take her back to her quarters. Those guys just swarmed around her, <laughs> so I went to the bar, had <laughs> a couple of drinks. They, they had all had a good time, and I took her back to the court. But uh, that, that was another one of those things. You see, other, other, uh, another, this one happened up in uh, Florence, the city of Florence. Do you remember uh, Duffy's Tavern? Any of those? Yeah. Well, the, Mr. Yeah, well, you, you know, uh, when they were touring, they gave a Duffy's Tavern uh, show, and Jinx Falkenberg was the, the girl actor. Well, I happen to have a little picture of Jinx Falkenberg right here. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Beautiful. But anyhow, those kind of things happen. Now, uh, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> Something. You moved around a lot. Did you get paid regularly or something? Or? I, I didn't have pay. I didn't even see any money. There, there's the money I had over there on the table. Uh, all different kinds of money. Uh, as I had enough to get by, I did, like I uh, get back to the headquarters, I had enough to get by. Oh. But uh, I wasn't getting any pay. For some. I wasn't in there in the, for the group of yeah. When we were told you the, the uh, ordinance outfit I was uh, assigned to, uh, we got a presidential citation, which I'm not wearing because somebody stole it. They, somebody stole my outfit one day <laughs> uh, in the, when I was out on the job, and, and when I came, they never expected me to come back, so uh, they, they took my outfit. And uh, that's the only time I had that gold patch. But anyhow, uh, yeah, the, this this shirt was not the original shirt. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, those are some of the things that uh, went on. But when we got to uh, uh, up to Florence, one day uh, I went out in the field and I went on a, a job. And when I was out there, I came across a parachute, a nice silk parachute. And uh, when I came back, why well, back to the headquarters, I mentioned to my my, one of my best buddies, Warren Officer Brown, and he said, oh, boy, look at that. I, I, he said, I know a seamstress that might be able to do something with this. So we go over to the seamstress with this big, nice silk parachute, and we talked to her, and she laid it out, and, and uh, well, what are we going to do with this? Well, I said, uh, I was married, and my wife was back home, of course. I said, well, I'd like to have something made for my wife, Agnes. So uh, she said, well, how big is she? I said, well, you know, a couple inches shorter than me, and a little bigger here, and a little bigger here. But, uh, so she's measuring up, and so she made me 
a very nice silk nightgown. <laughs> so that's all wrinkled right now. Did it fit you? <laughs> Today, but that's the only thing my wife would let me bring. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so big that Bernie got uh, a piece out of it, and uh, the leftovers, the seamstress, we left the seamstress in. In that same town, it was, when we entered the city of uh, Lawrence, uh, we went across the Bailey Bridge, and we had a uh, an office set up right opposite the railroad station, and in one corner was the police station. And the police were mounted police in the, the, the Italian mounted police. But uh, perhaps you've all seen this, the Palma Vecchia, you've all, all seen the, the famous bridge going over the Arno River where all the shops are on it. You see, you see it in every tourist ad. Well, there's a fellow by the name of Hugo Bellini that uh, he was a jeweler, he was an artisan well-known throughout the United States prior to the war. He's the one that, uh, his, uh, he had Saks and uh, uh, Fifth Avenue, and uh, he had the, the jewelry, his jewelry was being imported by our, uh, in Chicago and New York, in the better uh, stores. Well, this man owned a garden complex with all buildings going around it. And the Germans, when they pulled out, they shelled it with 88s. And so uh, a lot of the 88s had not gone off. Some of the buildings were damaged, but uh, they, the people had evacuated them. But he had rented uh, these buildings out to the, in peacetime for them. Well, when uh, this happened, he came into headquarters and asked, would somebody come over and take care of these dug shells. So I went over and I was successful in getting this place cleaned up. So he invited me over to his house for dinner. And uh, I didn't, uh, my Italian was nothing, and, but he could speak a little English. And so I went into dinner and uh, one evening and it, it was great. Uh, he had a beautiful home and uh, he had a wife and a little boy. Uh, I, I don't know how old the boy was, but he was about that high. <laughs> and uh, uh, we had a nice dinner, we had wine, and cigars, the whole bit. And we were sitting there, he said, now, I want to thank you some way. What can I do for you? I said, hey, I'm in the service. I have to do this, you know. And he said, well, just sit here a minute. And he said, uh, what I want you to do is draw me something like a, a pin or a ring or a earring or something or a body. So I sat down and I, I can't draw with the garden, so I thought, well, I'll draw a little basket and put some flowers in it, you know. And uh, I showed him the sketch and he said, okay, now uh, uh, just sit a minute. And he went back into the room and he came out with a cigar box. About, I have a cigar box over there or someplace. A cigar box full of stones, semi-precious and precious stones. And uh, they were <coughs> unmounted, you know. So he said, here, pick out some stones here. So I, I didn't know one jewel from another. I picked out a couple of I said, that's not so good. And he threw it around, he picked out some. Anyhow, he said, now, uh, I'm gonna have you come back. And uh, when you come back, uh, I'll have this made up for you. A couple of days later, I was able to go back and I, I picked up some sugar from the, and butter from the cooks and I went over and had a nice dinner. And he came out with this pin. And silver filigree with the jewels on it. And I'll, I'll leave this out on the table so you can see it. And so after, uh, he made this for my wife. So he presented this to me and we were sitting around smoking with scars. He said, now I think you said you had a mother and a sister and, a, and a, your wife back home. And he came out. He had earrings, a necklace, a brooch pin, and bracelet for my mother, for my wife, for 
my sister, uh, well, not, not a complete set for my sister, but uh, they, I forget what it was, uh, uh, Nicholas said. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, the cigar box was full of jewelry made by this artisan, and he gave the whole thing to me. Uh, I, of course, when I got her home, uh, I gave her all away. My parents have since passed on, so it was my sister. And, but uh, even my wife's two sisters got a pin.